I'm going to be talking about a technique that was originally developed for astronomy and how it's revolutionising ophthalmology and also neuroscience. Imagine you have some, some cognitive symptoms, such as memory loss. You might go through multiple tests, see different clinicians. You might go for an MRI test. You could be on a, a long waiting list. And of course, when, you, when you've got some symptoms, you really want to know what the diagnosis is. Otherwise, it can be quite worrying if it's prolonged. So imagine, rather than going through all these tests, you could go to your local opticians and have a quick eye test. They take an image of the back of your eye within several seconds that they can diagnose the condition. But imagine also that you don't have any symptoms and you go to your optometrist and you want to know what you might develop in the years to come. Imagine you could then get an eye test to do that because with certain diseases, what really matters is early intervention. So the diseases I'm talking about in particular here are not diseases that primarily affect the retina, so the back of the eye. I'm not talking about diseases that cause blindness. What I'm talking about are diseases that affect the, the health of the brain. Neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, psychiatric diseases such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. This is an image of the eye. At the front, you have the, the, the cornea, which is the clear window at the front, which gives the eye most of its power. So this, this is what bends the light rays to form an image at the back of the eye. You have your lens, your iris. This is what gives your eye its color, brown, blue, green. And then, of course, you have the retina. So the retina is the neural tissue at the back of your eye. Labeled here the fovea. So you can think of the retina as like a, a camera with many, many pixels. And if you imagine the, the fovea, this would be where your pixels will be highest density. So I've talked about diagnosing diseases that affect the brain using the retina. So the reason we can do this is that the retina, so the light sensitive film at the back of your eye, is actually part of the central nervous system. And the eye is directly connected to the brain. So you can see in this diagram, the eye being connected to the, the areas responsible for visual processing, but also there are specialized cells in the eye that are not necessarily involved in vision but project directly to areas that affect mood, cognition, memory, circadian timings. So we can really use the retina to diagnose these diseases and what, what we can actually do is we can diagnose disease using single cell resolution which is very difficult to do with techniques such as MRI. So how do we do this? So you've probably all been for the, to an optometrist and they take, uh, you sit in front of an instrument, you see a flash, and this is what you get on the screen, this image over here. So this is the, the typical image you get with conventional clinical technology. That area of retina there is about seven and a half millimeters. Now if we were to magnify that region to look at single cells, what would happen is we would just see this blurred out patch like that. So we really couldn't do single cell resolution in the, in the living eye and that's what we really need to be able to detect these diseases earlier. So why can't we do single cell resolution? I've got an image at up here of an eye. Imagine two cells at the back separated by um, thousands of a millimeter. The cells in the back of your eye are really tiny. What happens is when the light passes through your lens and cornea, because they're not a perfect shape, because they're optically quite poor, you can't resolve these two cells. So if you were to resolve them, what you would see is them separate like this, but what you actually see in practice is this. Because of the blur in the eye, they overlap, and so this is what affects your resolution. I just want to point out, even if you don't wear spectacle lenses, contact lenses, this will still happen in your eye. The optical system of the eye, even if you've got perfect vision, is really poor and you really can't do this in a, in a living eye with conventional technology. Luckily, astronomers have the answer to this. The technique's called adaptive optics. So imagine you're, you're viewing a, a star through, through the, and there was no atmosphere. You get a nice image on your camera here. But what's actually happening is when you're imaging a distant object, the light rays, you can think of it as passing through a bag of lenses that are constantly moving around. You can imagine the atmosphere to be 
to be these lenses constantly moving. And what happens is um, the rays no longer meet and form a nice focus. I've only drawn a couple, of ray, a couple of rays here, but in practice there are many, many rays and they don't meet at this nice focus. You might have noticed this, the effect of the atmosphere. If you look at a star really far away and you see it twinkling, this is because of the effect of the atmosphere. How do you fix that? In principle, it's quite simple. What you do is you have a deformable mirror. You can think of this mirror as kind of like a funhouse mirror. You place your mirror here, the light rays pass through, the mirror straightens these rays and you get a nice focused image. I've also drawn on there a sensor, so when you're correcting the direction of these rays, you need to sense what direction they're going in. And in astronomy, because the atmosphere is changing so fast, this sensor and, and flexible mirror is, is sensing and updating the mirror shape a thousand times a second. This is just to show you what it looks like. This is an example of an image with no adaptive optics or with adaptive optics. So it's really made a big difference to astronomy. And pretty much all ground-based telescopes now are getting equipped with adaptive optics. So the recent Nobel Prize by Angie Gez, she actually used adaptive optics when she was detecting the, the black hole. When we're imaging the retina, we do exactly the same thing. We put this deformable mirror or flexible mirror in between the eye and your camera. Because this mirror adapts or changes shape, this is why it's called adaptive optics. Over here you can see an actual example of a mirror. They're quite small. I've got a coin next to it. The mirror I've shown has lots of little magnets behind and it works on electromagnetic attraction. This mirror is constantly changing shape. You won't see this on the screen, but if you're watching this on video, then, then pause here. In the eye, it's kind of the same in astronomy. The rays are changing directions constantly. So if you were to, to look on your screen at these circles on the right, what you would see is kind of like a bow tie pattern rapidly rotating. And this is because the optics of your eye are changing shape rapidly. What causes them to change shape? Well, there's lots of reasons. There's the tear film, there's fluctuations in the shape of the lens. When you're fixating on an object, your eye is continually moving up to several tens of hertz or several hundred times a second and that's changing the shape of your eye and you've also got the effect of the pulse so there's blood flowing through the eye and this is what is making the, the changes in the shape so it's kind of like the same that we had in astronomy that you need something that's going to continually update I showed you this earlier, so this is your conventional camera, so just your normal clinical instrument. And this is, what, this is an example of what you get with an adaptive optics camera. These cells here, um, there are 250,000 cells per square millimetre. And the reason they're coded red, green and blue is because it's like pixels on your camera. The red are the red sensitive pixels, green for green and blue for blue. So not only in, in the diseases I mentioned that are affected, like for example Parkinson's, also these cells are hit in, in diseases that affect blindness. So adaptive optics is a really powerful tool for ophthalmologists. This is becoming more common in the clinic. The current difficulty is when you, when you build an adaptive optic system and you sit a patient down, it can take a long time to get a good image. And this is because there's so much, there's so much that needs to be optimized to really sit someone down and get a good image in, in every patient. So this is something I'm working on at the moment. How's the future going to be? One day, five, ten years time, you'll be able to walk into your high street opticians. They'll take an image of your retina and they'll be able to diagnose um, diseases affecting the brain many years earlier. Thank you for your time.